Hi, it's Thursday, May the 4th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through John's Gospel. And today it's um, today it's John chapter 20, uh, verses 11 to 18. And this is the chapter we all love, John 20. This is, this is the resurrection. We started reading it yesterday, and we heard about Mary coming to the tomb um, while it was still dark and finding it empty. Uh, she tells Peter and John, they rush to confirm the information. They get there, they look in. Oh my God, it's real. They leave, and then this is what happens. So it's John 20, 11 to 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she'd said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. We'll leave it go at that for the moment. Another little moment. Oh. And how do we start to wonder about this? I mean, oh. I'll confess up front. I have preached this text at least 30 times um, in my life, in my career. Um, and a couple of them were different. <laughs> no, I've preached this text in so many different ways, so many things that it's really hard for me to wonder about it um, without falling into a sermon I've preached or a sermon that I might yet preach. Um, but I guess I do that a fair bit anyway. So... So as I'm wondering about it, I, I guess I, I, I'm wondering a little bit about, about Mary, um, why she's weeping. But as I wonder, but to me it's obvious, why is she weeping? Because this is hard. Why is she weeping? She said the tomb was empty. The boys came. They saw that the tomb was empty. They, they ran off. Because I know all about Easter, I assume that the boys run off to tell everybody. But that's not what it says. It says they ran off home. So in this moment, they've come, they've looked. You're right, the tomb is empty. They've run off. Is she still weeping because she assumes that they've taken Jesus' body? Um, she's not thinking resurrection right now. She's thinking the loss of Jesus who has been so important to her. However you define their relationship, it is uh, a deep and involved relationship. Jesus has changed her life. And he is gone. And his tomb has been desecrated. Right now, in the Easter light, it's easy to say, oh, she should have understood this is the resurrection. This Jesus said he'd be resurrected. Of anyone, Mary should get that. Yeah, sure. But it's still hard. I, I, I think uh, of uh, the times I have been, you know, at, at deathbeds uh, with, with people from my faith community uh, or people from my life, you know, uh, people who I just, you know, I know personally. Um, and, and some of them have gone to the end of their life with such faith and calm and peace and have said things like, I'm, I can't wait to find out what happens next. Um, their faith is almost palpable. 
and my faith is strong. I, I believe that, that their death is not the end of anything. Um, anything that matters. Yes, it's their end of their physical time in my company, um, but it's not the end. And so I am spiritually happy for them. I'm happy for a good end. I'm happy for the adventure of what comes next. I'm happy for the embrace of God, all of that. And yet I find myself crying. Why am I crying? Am I crying because I doubt? Maybe, maybe it's not so good. I don't think so. I'm crying because I miss them. Because we had a relationship and a way of being. And now it's different. So when someone dear to me dies, I love them. And I know they love me. And I know the love that we share. And I know that they're with God. But I'm not having coffee on Tuesday with them. And, and I'm going to miss that. I am sad for that. So Mary might suspect the resurrection at this point. She might, in the back of her mind, going, yeah, this is what Jesus said. It's good. But she's also aware that she's not going to be walking from village to village with Jesus anymore. She's not going to be sitting and listening to him teach the crowd. She's not going to share a table with him. She is not going to do those things anymore. Yes, this is God's will, and it's glorious, and it's wonderful, and there's much to celebrate, but it's also sad. The relation, our relationship has changed. And I think that that's a really good example to see. I think it's good to see Mary cry, um, because... Because no matter how strong our faith, no matter how involved in our faith we are, no matter how all-encompassing our faith may be, we are human beings and we can be hurt. Change is not always easy. In fact, it rarely is easy. With every change, we give up a little something. There's always a little something to grieve. And Mary is doing that. And what I like is that in the midst of her grieving... she comes to understand that Jesus has been resurrected. Um, Peter and John, they came. Oh my God, they've gone home. Again, have they gone home to tell others? Have they gone home because they're afraid? Have they gone home because they don't want to share their emotions? I don't know. All I know is they're not sharing their emotions at all. They are cut off from their emotions in this story. I'm not trying to judge Peter or John. I don't know what they've been, been going through. Um, but the way John tells, the, the, the gospel writer John tells the story, we don't get any emotions from them. They don't see the angels. Jesus doesn't speak to them. But Mary weeps. She doesn't pretend that she's not sad. She doesn't pretend that the change is easy. She doesn't pretend it's all great. She's sad. And in that, she encounters the holy, literally encounters the holy. She sees two angels in white. That's the way John tells the story. Um, she sees, she has a, a, a luminous vision. She, she, she recognizes God's, God's holy presence, God's holy will in the world. Peter and John didn't see that. If I were preaching that, and I've never preached this before, by the way, but if I were preaching that right now, I might be preaching about how it is when we open up ourselves to the full spectrum of our experience. That is to say, our emotions, when we allow ourselves to feel, that's the invitation for God to, to enter in. That's where revelations happen. I talk to people who who, who, uh, who manage depression. But before they could manage it, when it seemed to be managing them in their darkest times, and their hardest times, the number of people that I have talked to who met God there. The faith of their childhood was gone in the midst of their depression, but what came in instead 
was a faith that they hold to this day, what I've often called an adult faith, another faith, a, a, a deeper faith. But it came through their depression. Now, I wouldn't say, therefore, everybody go ahead and uh, if you, you know, if you are managing depression, go off your meds so you can meet God. I'm not saying that at all. Um, if you have a good, healthy practice, say, oh, just stop that so you can meet God. Not saying that in the for a second. Um, but what I am saying is that when we can't muster our defenses, when we allow our emotions out in a healthy way, that's an invitation for God to come in. When we look and run, maybe not so much. And, and the angels ask her the question. Then Jesus asked her the same question. That's a great woman. Why are you weeping? That's, don't, that's not be confused with, oh, for God's sake, stop crying. That's not what that is. Woman, why are you weeping? Tell me about it. By the way, really good advice when you're dealing with somebody who's sad, uh, who is grieving, who is in the midst of whatever has led to this sadness. It's a great question to ask honestly. Where are the tears coming from? Why are you sad? Why are you weeping? Instead of, don't cry, everything's okay. It's not. It's funny, I remember as a kid when they, you know, hearing this story in church and it was sort of read that way as if, as if they're saying, woman, well, why are you weeping? Everything's great. And Jesus is like, hey, come on, why are you weeping? Here I am. But I don't think that's the question at all. I think this is actually an exam, a, a, a real invitation. Woman, well, why are you weeping? It's an opportunity for Mary to start to think about it. Why am I weeping? What is, what is the source of my tears? Do I believe that it's all for nothing now? Do I believe in the resurrection? Am I sad that things are going to change? Why am I afraid of things changing? Is it because I won't fit in in whatever comes next? Is it because is it because no one will respect me or love me the way that Jesus did uh, in life? And I'm afraid that I'm not going to have that anymore with Jesus, with Jesus resurrected, but not hanging out with me the same way. Like all of those, that's, that's a great question. Why are you weeping? And she answers, well, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. So at that point, she's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm because, because I haven't moved to the resurrection yet. Is kind of what that text is saying. She didn't know that until she said it. She's just crying. That opportunity to understand, that's the opportunity for God to come in. So in her tears, she sees the angels. In the questions, she will then see God or see Jesus, right? Why are you weeping? And as she answers that, then Jesus comes up and asks her again, she doesn't know who Jesus is yet, but, you know, the holy is getting closer. The recognition is nearer. Uh, she's asked the question again. She says it, and then Jesus says her name, and boom. Now she gets it. She gets the resurrection. She sees God in the world. She sees the promise fulfilled. She sees all of these things. Because she dared to cry. Because she dared to answer the question, why am I crying? Honestly. Right? I don't know if she's answered it correctly. I'm not her... I'm not her therapist. If I were her best friend, I might say, I don't know if you're crying because you think his body's gone. I think you're crying because you're afraid you're going to be left alone in the world. But I don't know that. But what I do know is that she dared to answer and the Holy broke him and Jesus speaks her name and the, the cool thing about that is I mean and it's so beautifully written he just simply says Mary in that moment she knows that Jesus knows her it's not that she recognizes Jesus it's that Jesus recognizes her and then she recognizes him but she she feels seen. I know it's a term we use a lot these days. Well, you know, I want to feel seen. They, I see you. But it's real here. 
And it's real when we say it. We just, it's not a phrase we, some of us grew up with. And we hear it now, you're like, well, okay, you see me, whatever. No, no, you see me, which means you understand what I'm feeling. You understand the pressures on me. You get the context in which I'm living. You, oh, you see me. I don't have to explain it to you. You see me. Mary. Oh my God. And now she realizes that yes, the relationship has changed, but the relationship is not gone. Mary sees her. And Jesus sees her. Hmm. I guess if I was thinking about preaching it, the other thing that happens is, you know, uh, is that, that she, uh, I imagine, hugs him, grabs him, right? Do not hold on to me, he says, uh, because I've not yet ascended to the Father. Um, the, uh, when I was a kid, when we first read that King James Version, I think probably in the Good News Bible, even earlier Bible, other Bibles uh, said things like, do not touch me. Um, but that's not what the word, that's not really what it is. No, it's, no, it's do not hold on to me. And I'm sure you would love to me for to give you a full uh, lesson on what it means to use a present imperative um, with a negative. Um, <laughs> yes, welcome. Thanks, Norman. Could you give us a lesson in Greek and maybe some grammar points? Uh, but the word used is a present imperative uh, with a negative, which essentially means stop doing something. It doesn't mean don't do it. It means stop doing it. Does that make sense to you? So I love the translation that says, do not hold on to me or do not cling to me as opposed to do not touch me. Okay, so here it says, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. So so she is holding him. And and, and, and Jesus is saying, you have to let go. Um, and I think that that isn't so much a moment in history as much as it is the continuation of this feeling of the relationship has changed, Mary. And that's why you're crying. And the relationship has changed. Don't hold on to me. Don't hold on to me. Don't live in the past with me. Don't try to make the present last forever with me. Take this moment. Build on it. And let's move into the next moment. Don't hold on to me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. Uh, but go and tell my brothers, um, tell them uh, that I am ascending to the Father, your Father, and to my God, your God. Um, for me, Jesus is very much saying, yeah, this is a moment, and it's a good moment, but we're not going to stay here. Much like much like the transfiguration uh, with Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, uh, when, you know, Jesus glowed the voice of God and Moses and Elijah were there and Peter's like, oh, we're going to stay here. This will be great. And he says, no, nah, we're not staying here. We're going down the mountain. I, this is the same moment for me. Mary, we're not staying in this moment. This is a good moment and you're never going to lose this moment. This moment's always yours. But we're going to move into the next moment too. Faith is not a static thing. As much as we'd like to hang on to our mountaintop experiences or our resurrection moments, it's not the way the world works is not the way that faith works. Faith carries us into the next moment and into the next moment. And everything that happens here for Mary will become relevant. It, it, she'll call on this experience later in her life when she's struggling with this or celebrating that. When a friend of hers is dying, she will remember that resurrection is real, that God is in the world. When she is on her own deathbed, she will Remember that Jesus spoke her name, that God sees her and knows her, and that will carry her through hard times. When she celebrates, uh, she'll realize she is celebrating with God because of this moment. So we build on the moments, but we don't stay in them. Staying in them is stale. We, we continue to move on. So Mary has spent three years with Jesus. Walking and learning and sharing and helping and doing part, being part of the ministry. Uh, and that was wonderful and that's shaped her life. And this resurrection moment has shaped her life. By the way, so do the moments at the foot of the cross as Jesus died. She didn't stay there. And why would she want to? Those were hard moments. But you also don't stay here in the, in the, in the really good moments either because you carry them with you 
and they prepare you for what's coming next. Now I am definitely preaching. <laughs> um, a couple other things that pop out to me that might be worth wondering about. I won't do much with them just to say, Jesus says, um, do not hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say, I'm ascending to my Father. And So go to my brothers. That's interesting. Um, I don't recall Jesus referring to the disciples, the apostles, as brothers before. Remember when he said to them, you're no longer my servants, but I call you friends. Now he's calling them brothers. I find that a little bit interesting. Um, but I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, also, I find it interesting that he says, I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. It doesn't say I am ascending to the, the father, to our God. It doesn't say that. He says, mine and yours, mine and yours, which seems to indicate that our relationship to God is a little different than Jesus' relationship to God. Otherwise, why would you say, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to God, you know, our God. Well, he is going to God, and it is your God, and it is my God, <laughs> if I'm Jesus. But that God is so indwelling in me, I am that God, and that God is me, and we have been, always been that way since all time. And so the relationship is a little different. Um, and I think that John wants us to realize that. This is, this is John's assertion that Jesus and his brothers uh, are different. As much as Jesus is fully human and experiencing the human condition, uh, and, and, so, and as much as they are brothers, there is still something unique about Jesus. Um, there would have been those in the time of, of, of John's gospel, just as there are people today, uh, very faithful people who very much recognize Jesus as an incredible human being who is so obedient to God's will, so open to God, um, that they channeled God for others. And, and that's, and that faith works for them. I think John is saying, no, Jesus is not a human endeavor. Jesus is a divine endeavor. Right? So it's not a human being who aspired to be with God, but in fact, Jesus is God aspiring to be with human beings. And that is different. Um, and I think that's what John is hinting at. I think so. But I don't know. Maybe you'll wonder about it and come up with something different. Uh, whatever we do, I just hope we all spend some time wondering today. It's the resurrection story. How can you not want to wonder about that? Um, so for now, just let me offer a prayer and then uh, we'll see what happens. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you for Easter. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for the stories of Easter, of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to wonder about them, to be amazed by them, even baffled at times, challenged, but also comforted, informed, and inspired. God, we ask that our wondering today open our hearts and our minds, help us grow in faith, and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And that is enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and we'll see what happens uh, with the apostles. Because trust me, the story's not over. Uh, so until I get to see you, well, God bless you. Please know that God sees you, speaks your name as profoundly, as seriously as Jesus says Mary's name, um, knows you, loves you. And, and, and more than that, God's love moves through you into the world. 
So thank you for being you. You make a difference. We'll see you tomorrow.